What is homecoming and what was your experience like? I would encourage anybody online to come and join us at homecoming. It's an it's an opportunity to make the unfamiliar familiar, mm. to make to make the distant near. Because once you've been to homecoming, then you go back home and when you're streaming service and you're having a watch party, you can say, I've stood on that stage, I've seen that baptistry, I've stood in the foyer where Stephen is right now. Yeah. I've been in the parking lot. I've been behind the scenes to meet the people that make SE Online possible and be able to express our gratitude, you know? And so it just makes it even feel more like home. Well, happy Sunday, family. Good to be with you. Good to see you. Excited to have you here today and want you to know, online family, we do have something special. I hope you caught that promo right before me. We have homecoming coming up October the 7th through the 9th, and we'd love to have you. A little Southern hospitality, welcome you into the family. Some of you have never been to Louisville here, one of our campuses, and we just want to open the door because we'd love to see you, love to meet you so that we can really make this more of a connected family thing. And so speaking of connection, if you're brand new, or even if you've been here a while, if there's something we can do for you today, if we can pray for you, get you connected, help you take your next steps in Jesus, whatever it is, would love to do that with you. So we have been in a powerful new series called Alelon. And in this new series, we literally, for the last six weeks, have just been talking about the power of one another. And so Dave Stone is here today. He's going to be closing out this series. You're not going to want to miss it. And so I caught up with him just a few moments ago. Why don't we listen in? Well, here we are, family, with uh, Dave Stone. And Dave, I got to tell you, I uh, was in the Shine Cafe. That's our special needs ministry. And they, uh, this is from Hayden. And oh, uh, yes. Hayden made you, he, he made you this sweet. I, nice. I promised I would give it to you. So. No, I, I love it. I've got a lot of these in my office. So, and, and some of them are posted. This is good work right here. Oh, thank man, you. I'm thank you. you. Hayden. So we have had, we really have, we've had an amazing time <laughs> through this series. It could not have hit at a better time. I mean, it could not have hit a better time. I, I think for all of us is that we've just been talking about the power of one another. And so yeah. here's my question. I just want, I just want to tee you up. Um, I, I'm walking away with a lot. Just mm -hmm. I'm committed to a few things. What, as you're walking away, as some people that we love here and online are walking away, what are some big rock mm -hmm. hopes that you have for them in terms of walking away? What do you hope shifts in them? Well, I hope that we're, we're brought back to what Christ said was our, the greatest commandment, and that is to, to, to love our Lord our God and also to, to love one another. And so that's what's at the root of all of this. And uh, one of the things I, I stumbled onto through this series was that every single time you see a one another command, it's either prefaced or followed by something about love. Yeah. And so everything comes back to love. Uh, my other favorite takeaway from the series, and you had a great message that I got to hear, and Bryson had a great one, and also got to hear some of the other campus pastors. But my, my favorite takeaways were just the fact that I need to value people more and uh, realize that every single person I come in contact with, um, God loves them just as much as he loves me. He can't love anyone more or less than he loves you, than he loves us. And uh, that's a great takeaway for me is just to realize the value and to honor others uh, above myself. Uh, I love it. I love it. And, and today is going to be powerful. Mm -hmm. And so I want you to brace yourself for it. It's going to be so good. So thanks so much. Just love you. Thank you. Thanks for hopping in. And man, yeah. great, great to be here. Grateful to have you. Yeah, and so it is going to be a great day. We're going to lean in today. Last, again, last week in our series of Lay Loan. You're not going to miss it. So I just want to encourage you, create a little space in your heart, create a little space, whatever you're doing, wherever you're at, just so you can really receive what it is that God's going to be planting in you, in us today. And so to kind of get us ready for worship this morning, just want to read from Psalm 18, starting in verse one, it says this, it says, I love you, Lord, Lord, my strength, the Lord is my rock, my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise and I have been saved from my enemies. So brothers, sisters, we love you. Open up your heart, open up your spirit and your chest. Let's head into worship together. Welcome church. We're so excited to worship with you this morning. Would you lift your voice with me and sing?
this world is sifting sand It's not my solid rock When nations rise and fall Lord, you still my heart When tomorrow's on my mind And worry has my side This place is not my home Thank you, Jesus You're with me through the night I know you chose me Because you love No power Sing it with some faith this morning It's our confidence I know you're for me You'll never forsake Isaiah 23 speaks this promise of God over those that are his. He will keep in perfect peace the one whose mind is stayed on him. The word stayed here means to rest on, to lean in, to take hold of. And maybe you've heard the word peace in Hebrew, it's the word shalom. But in this text, the term perfect peace is actually shalom, shalom. And here's why that matters. 
because the repetition communicates the depth and intensity of peace that God wants to bring to those who are his. Someone said it like this, if one assurance of God's peace is not enough, he will follow it up with a second and a third. It's not a temporary peace or a circumstantial peace. It's a peace beyond our own understanding, beyond our own logic. And Isaiah says that this peace is found in the one whose mind is stayed on him, who takes hold of him. And that's what we do when we participate in communion. We take hold of him again and we remind our physical bodies, our emotions, even our minds, that the way of Jesus is not just about doing or experiencing. It's also about thinking. And where we set our mind is essential to how we step into this morning and even this week. So as we enter into this time of communion, the question we wanna reflect on is, where have you set your mind this week? What have you been thinking on? Because oftentimes, I've seen it in my own life, the answer to that question often reveals where I'm placing my trust. So the song we're about to sing is called Behold. To behold means to fix your eyes upon. And as a church, this is a song that's written by our church for our church as a reminder and a call to fix our eyes on Jesus, to behold Jesus, because whatever we behold, we become. You fix your eyes on the troubles of this world, you'll be troubled. You fix your eyes on the worries of life, you'll be worried. But we as followers of Jesus come to this time of communion to fix our eyes back on him, to set our mind on him and experience his perfect peace and become like him. So as you hold communion today, behold Jesus. He walked among us and he is here with us. Behold Jesus, he has come to bring us life and joy and hope and peace. Behold Jesus, he is coming again. And no matter what becomes of this world, we will behold him. We will fix our eyes on him. We will stay our mind on him. The one who is perfect peace, the one who brings perfect peace. Whatever you're walking through today, as you hold communion, would you behold him again?
long for that day when we get to behold Jesus face to face. We thank you that you sent him, that you made a way for us. And we thank you, God, that in this life, until then, we have you to lead us and guide us and shepherd us. We just thank you that you forgave us first. You're the one who has set us free, the one who changes us, God. And so um, I just ask that in this place, our hearts would be open to whatever you wanna say that we would just lean into you, lean into your heart, and we would just receive everything that you have for us. We love you, it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Y'all can have a seat. Have you ever done something so foolish that you know you need forgiveness, but you don't know if you'll ever receive it? I, I usually get into trouble when I speak before I think. My parents used to always say to me, think before you speak. And there's a reason they were constantly reminding me of that. And I've got plenty of examples when I, I did not do that, but there is one that kind of jumps off the page to me. And that's when I went to my 10 year high school reunion and uh, I had my wife Beth with me. Of course, she didn't know anybody there. Those are kind of awkward settings. You haven't seen these people in a decade. They don't look the same. You do, of course, but they, they don't look the same, right? And so I'm trying to introduce her to people. And at one point that evening, I'm talking with Frank. Frank introduces us to his wife. And we we're making small talk, chit chat there for a few minutes. And then there was a lull in the conversation. And there was just that awkward silence. And so I... I decided to fill that silence. And I looked at my new friend, Frank's wife, and I said, I see you're expecting, when is your baby due? <clears throat> yeah, right. And she looked at me and said, I'm not pregnant. And I said, are you sure? Uh, no, no, I didn't say that, no. I thought it, I didn't say it though, right? But I, I couldn't say anything because when you have a, a foot in your mouth, there's not a whole lot you can say, right? And it was terrible. We ended the conversation quickly and we walked away. Beth was exasperated with me. It was, it was not a good night, right? Now, here's the good news. You make that mistake one time in your life, you will never do it again, all right? You can be pregnant with triplets and be two weeks past your due date. I'm not gonna bite. <laughs> 
I'm not going to say anything, right? Now, I don't know if that gal has forgiven me or not because I've been, I've been frightened to go back to another high school reunion ever since then, right? But we've been in a series when we've been looking at the one another commands of the New Testament, and it's been teaching us how God wants us to interact with one another. And some of them, they, they come more naturally than, than others. But today we conclude the series <clears throat> with a one another expectation that goes against the grain. We're told by multiple mouthpieces in the New Testament to forgive one another. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter four, verse 32 says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. The next chapter begins, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us. Have you noticed how every one another command has either right before it or right after it an admonition for us to love one another? When you came in at all of our campuses, you, you received a rock. And uh, th this rock is something that you have right now in your hand. Feel free to take it out if you'd like to. Everybody got one of these rocks. And, and it's my hope and prayer that, that you won't leave with this rock though. Now, I've had people say, you know, what, what are these rocks for? I had one person say to me, hey, do we get to throw these at you? <laughs> why, why would someone say that? I, I said, no, Beth. <laughs> no, no, no. And I know some of you think, oh, I know what he's doing. This is a marketing ploy. This is branding. His name's Stone. I know what he's doing. No. But take a look at that rock, and I want you to hold it. I want, I want you to, to, to feel it in your hand. I want you to think of this rock as a representation. Sometimes people use these as a weapon when they've been wrong. We might call them rocks of retaliation or retribution or rocks of revenge. Let me tell you a story. Maybe you've heard it. It involves a half-dressed woman, some conniving men, some rocks, and a man named Jesus. The story is found for us in John chapter eight, verses one through 11. And it's where Jesus could have enacted punishment or condemnation, but instead he extended grace and forgiveness. It was in the morning and Jesus has already been teaching in the temple courts. A crowd is listening. They're hanging on his every word, but there's an interruption. And no doubt there were a lot of these in their hands as these men came on the scene. We pick it up in John eight, verse three. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And in the law of Moses were commanded us to stone such women. Now, what, what do you say? And they were using this as a question, as a trap in, in order to have a basis for accusing him. Now notice they bring the woman, they don't bring the man, which tells you something about their agenda. And notice that in that setting, Jesus is in between a rock and, and a hard place because what is said is, well, we've got him because if he says, well, no, no, don't stone her, then Jesus is claiming to be greater than Moses, the one who brought down the Levitical law to them. And if he says, yeah, start throwing them and give me some of them, then so much for all of his lessons on, on kindness and on love. So they've got him trapped. Look at the second half of verse six. But Jesus bent down and he started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. And at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman that was standing there. So Jesus allowed these men to self-convict themselves and they begin to, to leave the premises. And they leave from the older to the younger. Those who had been around the block a lot more and were a little bit wiser, they, they realized they were no match and they, they left. I like the way Max Lucado says it. He says, they left from the grayest beard to the blackest beard, dropping their rocks of righteousness, intended to stone, the lust out of her life. And there Jesus stood next to this woman. 
And instead of condemning her, he used this as an opportunity to encourage her spiritually. Verse 10, Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Jesus, the son of God, the physical manifestation and representation of God the Father, is right there giving this message to her. And so John 8 gives us a picture of how Jesus is a perfect embodiment of both grace and truth. We see the grace, then neither do I condemn you. We see the truth, go now and leave your life of sin. He doesn't condone the sin, nor does he condemn the sinner. And the only one who was without sin and had every right to start throwing rocks was Jesus. But he chose forgiveness over judgment. As I mentioned to you a minute ago, you, we all came into this room and we, we were given a rock. And it's my hope and my prayer that, uh, that this will mean something to you for not just this message, but for, for days to come. You were given a rock, but truth is, there were probably a lot of us who came in already carrying one. And you brought it with you. And you carry it everywhere you go. And you've carried it for a long time. Ever since your boss let you go without cause, ever since you found yourself ostracized by the people in your neighborhood, ever since that classmate cheated off of you, or your spouse cheated on you. Maybe it was a coworker who stole a, an idea from you and pitched it to the boss. Maybe it was an uncle who stole your innocence at a very young age and the emotional pain is still there. And whatever it was, it may have been years ago, but you still carry the rocks and you find security and satisfaction in holding someone hostage over the hurts that they've inflicted and the rock goes wherever you go. Hey, I, I understand. <laughs> I, I, I really do. There's no judgment here. But how long are you going to carry him? How much time will you waste? And in order for us to be able to forgive others, we have to have a healthy and accurate understanding of forgiveness. So let's talk about forgiveness a little bit. And let's divide it into three different sections. Section number one, forgiveness. Believe it. Forgiveness, believe it. This is not a pipe dream. This is not wishful thinking. It's truly possible. And it's the foundation of this, this message. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. You remember King David back in the Old Testament from on top of the palace balcony, he's, he's out there on the rooftop balcony and just after the women have put their kids to bed, that was a time when women sometimes bathed. First time they had a minute all day. And David had quite a view from where he was up there. And he saw a beautiful woman and he summoned for her. Didn't matter that he was married, didn't matter that she was married. And after months of trying to hide his sin of lust and adultery and deceit and eventually murder, he finally comes clean and confesses and repents of what he's done. And he gives us a peek into his prayer journal as he walks through the depth of his appeal to God in Psalm chapter 51, verses one through four. He says, have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt, purify me from sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. And so it culminates with this picture of repentance and taking ownership of the sin that for months he denied. And David requests, no, he begs for God to forgive him. In the New Testament in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, it says, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. David had godly sorrow. Sometimes we just have worldly sorrow. We're just sorry we got caught. In Psalm 103, verses 11 and 12, I hope you'll hear this and I hope you'll hold on to this. 
For as high as the heavens are above the earth, this is David writing, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west. Don't miss this. David wrote this in about 1000 BC. Thought the world was flat at that time. God could have inspired David through his Holy Spirit to, to write that God has removed our sin as far as the north is from the south. But we have a North Pole and we have a South Pole, but still 3,900 miles, that's a pretty long ways to separate my sin. But God always does immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. And what does he do? Instead, he takes our sin as far as the East is from the West. I can head East today and I can head East for the rest of my life. I can take a car, I can take a boat, I can take a plane, I can circle the globe infinity. I can still be going East. And the God of the universe chose to tell you today, I will take your sin as far as the east is from the west. In other words, he banishes it. It's gone. He doesn't see it anymore. Now, there may be earthly consequences. There may be legal penalties because of your sin and for what's taken place. But if you have given your life to Christ and you sincerely repent of your sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive you of that sin. Forgiveness, believe it. Secondly, forgiveness, extend it. This is what God expects of his followers in one another relationships as we interact. We've covered a lot of territory in this Alelan series, but this one is so important. And throughout scripture, we are commanded to forgive others. Paul gives us a, a good reason to do so in Colossians chapter three, verse 13. It says, bear with each other, Forgive one another as the Lord forgave you. Now, I'm not trying to minimize your pain. I'm not trying to discount the hurt that you've experienced. You may have been bullied. Perhaps you've been falsely accused of something. Maybe some neighborhood teens vandalized your car. Maybe you've been hurt by a pastor. Or perhaps a drunk driver took the life of a loved one. You know, there are some occasions where it just, it just seems like uh, stoning might be okay or at least a heavy pelting, right? You know, there's a verse that we don't talk about very often, but Jesus is going to share the implications for those who, who choose not to forgive others. This is Matthew chapter six, verses 14 and 15. Jesus said, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. Now we hear that verse, and when we hear it, we immediately want to add our own qualifiers and try to say what Jesus really meant to say. Well, Jesus doesn't mean that literally, or, or what, he, what he means is that we need to forgive as long as it's, it's not a big sin against us. Or, or we need to forgive if the person asks us for forgiveness or we need to forgive if, it, if it's been five years or, or 10 years and time has passed. After all, I deserve to be angry for a while and have them experience some hatred for some amount of time. And I know some of the situations that some of you are in. And I've talked with you about some of them. And I can't imagine how difficult it would be to offer forgiveness. But forgiveness means releasing my right to retaliate. That's what forgiveness is. It means voluntarily taking away my weapon. It means I, I can't throw it back to harm the person who harmed me. And Satan loves to use unforgiveness and bitterness to his advantage because the longer he can get you to hold on to that rock, the more difficult it is for you to let go. And you think in your mind that you're holding the other person hostage when you withhold reconciliation or forgiveness. But just the opposite occurs. It's like being imprisoned and you're barricaded behind the bars of bitterness and you are the only one who can make bitterness grow in your life. And you are the only one who can choke it out and allow Christ's joy to grow in your heart. And the root of bitterness only grows when watered by the moisture of our memory and then fertilized by our failure to forgive. I can't, I can't force reconciliation 
You, you, you know that. I can't make a person forgive someone. And while I've been talking, you've, you've wanted to yell out and you've wanted to say, hey, you, you don't know how difficult my brother is or you have no idea what, what my neighbor is like that I have to live next to. Are you mad at the entire world? Or her false piety and condescending spirit has wrought havoc in our family tree. And we want revenge. Some of you can remember back to Desert Storm. You remember back then, that's when we didn't really have email. We didn't have Wi-Fi. The places that had Wi-Fi, it was, it was pretty poor. But those who were over in, in Desert Storm, they had to get all of their correspondence by snail mail, the old fashioned way. And so whenever there was mail call, they were always excited. And one time a soldier got a letter and he recognized his girlfriend's handwriting. He got so pumped up about it, but he opened up the letter and she was breaking up with him. It was a Dear John letter. And she broke up with him through the mail. And then at the end, to add insult to injury, the PS said this, said, please send me back my favorite picture of myself because I would like to use that photograph for the county newspaper for my engagement picture. You talk about kicking a guy when he's down, right? But all his buddies, they came to his rescue. You know what they did? They went throughout all the barracks and they got all the soldiers to just turn in one picture of their girlfriend. They took a shoebox, they filled this up with hundreds of pictures of gals and they had the guy put one picture of his ex-girlfriend in there and then they had him write this note to her. Please find your picture in the shoebox and return the rest. For the life of me, I can't remember which one you were. <laughs> we like that. We like it when somebody gets revenge. We like it when somebody gets what they've got coming. But forgiveness releases my right to hurt you back. And if there is to be any punishment administered, leave that in the hands of God, the, the perfect judge. Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Do not take revenge, my friends, but, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Well, forgiveness, believe it. Extend it. And finally, accept it. You know, the woman caught in the act of adultery, she, she may have deserved some of these rocks. And King David, for what he did, he, he probably deserved some of these rocks. But we deserve these rocks too. The Bible says that for all have sinned and fallen short of, of the glory of God. And you can fill in the blank for that decadent or despicable moment or, or that time when you had that, that spirit of arrogance or that self-righteousness. But we deserve these rocks too. And David wrote the majority of the Psalms and we learned that he, he tried to cover up his sin for months and he didn't repent. He tried to gloss over and cover up his adulterous relationship and Bathsheba's pregnancy. And he says in Psalms that during that time of concealing, it says he was wasting away inwardly because that's what happens when we, we don't confess our sin or we don't take steps to change. But in the next verse, this is what he says. In Psalm chapter 32, verse five, it says, then I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. God could, could just forgive our sin and that would be really big to have a clean slate, but he does immeasurably more. He, he forgives the guilt of our sin. We've been talking about alelon and, and that's the Greek word for one another. The New Testament was, was written in Greek originally. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And so in this particular verse, in Psalm 32, verse five, there are four different words for sin that King David uses in this one verse. Each Hebrew word that he chooses describes one of the specific ways in which David sinned. The first time you see sin there, it's an archery term. It means to miss the mark. We got off target. We, we, we all have sinned and fallen short. Iniquity, it, it's a, a gross term. It's, it's perversion. It would be the king walking out on the palace balcony at bathing time a distortion of what is right. 
It would be equivalent to 1,000 BC pornography. Transgression. That is a defiant disobedience toward God. And that's how David acted. And he eventually called himself on it. And the final word for sin is different than the first. It, it, it's a, a Hebrew word for deceit. It means to trick yourself. You're, you're deceiving yourself about the poor choice that you've made and you're, you're trying just to, to make it sound like it, it was okay to do that. You say, well, Dave, the, the Bible speaks of, uh, uh, of sin that can't be forgiven. Uh, and that's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. You're, you're exactly right. But that is not a one-time sin. That's not a moment in time. It's, it's a lifestyle of rejection, uh, of saying no to Jesus Christ. And they are past the point of no return. And only God knows when a person reaches that point. Why does David give us such detail and, and such honorous vulnerability as he talks about his sin? I'll tell you why. I think he wants us to know that there is nothing that you can do. That God is not capable of forgiving. Any sin you've committed, God can forgive if you confess it and if you repent of it. Sam Houston was the first president of the Republic of Texas, and I've heard he was a rather rude and, and crude man with a pretty sordid past. And later in life, he made a commitment to Christ and was, was baptized in a river. And the preacher said to him, Sam, your sins are washed away. And Sam Houston replied, God help the fish. <laughs> and he's got the right idea. I mean, leave all of your sins of the past, present, and future in that baptistry and walk with Christ and walk in the light with the confidence that comes through the forgiveness that he offers and extends to you. And some of you think that God can forgive everyone else's sin, but not yours. Not what you did 20 years ago, not what you did 20 days ago. It's, it's just too much. And you picture an angry God holding a whole bunch of rocks in his hands and for some reason he takes joy in, in condemning us and barraging us with rocks of righteousness. But the picture we have of God is shown to us through Jesus Christ and, and he didn't throw a rock. He had men drop there. But in Psalm 32, David hits on every type of sin. And David assures us that our God is not only big enough to forgive the sin, but he is the only person who has the right to throw rocks, but instead he chooses to drop them. The sin of missing the mark. The sin of perversion. The sin of defiant disobedience. The sin of deceit. He takes every sin that you can imagine. And he says, the blood of Jesus Christ can cover that up. You probably know what John 3, 16 says. Can I remind you of it? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. You know what the next verse says? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. You say, Dave, I've, I've done some pretty bad things. So have I. You say, Dave, I've done some really bad things. So have I. Someone said the nature of your sin is not the issue. The nature of God is the issue. And his nature is for the two to be reconciled to be in a right relationship with one another, made possible by the one who already paid for your sin and the punishment that, that he took was what we deserved. I know that some of you are, are still hung up back on extending forgiveness to someone. You've been wronged or you've been deeply wounded or maybe you've been hurt by someone and so you just, you just continue to, to hold on to them and you hold on to them pretty tight. Let me tell you, I can relate. There have been times in my life when I struggled with forgiving someone. Those, those seasons and each of those cases, they were just, they were tough. My, my anger would gradually build toward the person or, or, or toward people. And my inner resentment became all consuming. And I, I, I wanted 
I wanted bad things to happen to that person. I wanted some type of revenge. And Jesus says, if you hate someone, you've already committed murder in your heart. And so from God's viewpoint, mentally, I had committed murder in my mind many times as I wanted to return evil for evil. And that's not a good place for your mind and heart to be. And so in all those occasions, whenever that happens, I, I always have to start by making myself pray for that other individual or that other couple or those other people. And over time, as I start praying for them regularly, it's not fun to do. Over time, God always does his work. And through that process, God always reveals something to me. You know what he reveals? He reveals my multiplicity of sins. And each time God leads me to extend forgiveness, it, it might be a process. It might take weeks. It might take months. But afterwards, I, I always feel lighter. I feel more free. And you know why? It's because I've dropped a rock. Instead of throwing it, Someone said bitterness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. All it does is eat you up. And I know in order for my sins to be forgiven, I, I need to do that. Forgiven people forgive people. But to be real honest with you, usually in those situations, the greatest motivation is not even the fact that God won't forgive me, but the greatest motivation is all the crud that God's already forgiven me of. If you are not the worst sinner that you know, then perhaps you're not being honest. There will be more people who lie about me and who hurt me. There will be more people who stab you in the back and hurt you. But remember what Henry Cloud says. He says, control the things you can control and the things you can't, surrender them to God. And life, life's too short to let someone else's past behavior mess up your life and affect your present and future. So let go of that injustice. And perhaps you need to think back over the past few years and, and maybe you need to make something right with someone else because you've, you've wronged someone and they're the one who is holding the rock. We have this tendency that when it's our sin to expect that people should just drop the rock. But when it's someone who has wronged us, we, we, we crave the thrill that we think we'll get from throwing it. We minimize the way that we hurt others and we maximize the way that we've been wounded. So extend the same forgiveness that you've received from Christ onto others who have wronged you. Your vertical relationship with God will be weakened when your horizontal relationships with others are strained. But when you get both directions working together, it paints a picture of the cross. It gives us a glimpse of Jesus. Who do you need to forgive? I don't know who that might be in your life. It, it may be someone who's done something to you and wronged you in some way and you've been holding the rock for a long time and maybe today you dropped the rock. Others of you, you, you may need to forgive God. Oh, it, it's, it's not that God sinned or that God did something wrong. That's not what I mean. God's perfect. But you have a grudge against him because he's all powerful and yet he didn't intervene when you needed him the most. And that person passed away. Or your career path didn't unfold the way you think that it should have. Or that medical diagnosis was just the opposite of what you wanted. And so you blame God. Maybe it's time for you to forgive God and realize that he's the giver of every good and perfect gift. And for many of you, I wonder if the person that you need to drop the rock for and the person you need to forgive is yourself. And you believe that God can forgive all these other people that are seated around you, but not that spring break, not that abortion that you financed, not that abortion that you had, not that breach of integrity that made you so much money on that business deal. And so today I am asking you to give yourself the gift of forgiveness. All that you know about yourself, in spite of all of that, to give yourself forgiveness, 
Can you just believe what we learned about what God's word says? He'll take your sin and put it as far as the east is from the west. So be willing to drop the rock and forgive yourself. There are these silver trash cans at every one of our campuses. And in a few minutes, all you're gonna hear is just the, the sound of people letting go of the past and the sound of rocks landing in those bins. And trust me, every rock has a story. And I would ask that you would do that as a visible expression to God, that you want to extend grace and forgiveness just as God has, and you just wanna let it go. Someone said, we look most like animals when we kill. We look most like humans when we judge, but we look most like God when we forgive. And so I'm gonna pray, and then at each of our campuses, we'll explain what's going to happen next. Pray with me. Lord, your word tells us in Hebrews chapter eight, verse 12, that you take our sin and you remember it no more. And it's so hard for us to comprehend that, that an all-knowing God, who is the definition of wisdom, that you can have a graciously forgetful memory when it comes to our sin. Lord, may we extend that same grace to others. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. We have these silver cans at, at the doors all throughout the worship center. They're all throughout the balcony. They're in the backs of the sections up there. They're, they're down here in the front. They're strategically placed all throughout the sanctuary and they're there so that you can get rid of your rocks. The baggage, the pain, the guilt, the anger that, that you've been carrying. And don't be held hostage any longer. You know, there was a, there was a moment when you came into church and I watched you come in and you were looking for a place to sit. And in that moment, you had two things, one in each hand. You had a communion cup in one, you had a stone in the other one. And that's the choice that you have before you. Jesus has already taken these rocks. He's, He's taken that beating for you at the cross. He chose to take what we deserve. He chose to take that on himself. He went to the cross and his blood covers over our sins if we place our trust in him. Or you can continue to choose the rock. And you might not be ready to drop the rock today. And some pretty cool stories this morning. People just, just wrestling with this. And if that's where you are right now, then feel free to take that rock with you. And I hope that you'll just pray every time you look at that rock that God will begin to enable you to forgive in the days to come. Hey, I don't wanna manipulate your emotions and have you do something that your heart's not ready to do. That won't mean anything. But I will say this. There are some of you, it's time. And you need to let it go. And you've held on long enough. And we're gonna sing a couple of songs quietly. I'm going to ask right now that our church staff and some of our leaders, if, if they would come down front, we haven't had a prayer time like this in, in a while. So come on down right now, uh, church staff. And they're going to be down front down here. And uh, they're going to be here for, for prayer. And if you need prayer, you just come down and they'll pray with you. And uh, if you need to go to the next step room and talk to someone about giving your heart to Jesus Christ and making that decision, or you wanna pray privately with someone, you can, you can go to the next step room over there. But if I can just say this to you, there are some sounds in, in churches that are distracting, but there are other sounds that aren't. It's the sound of that communion cup crinkling as you open it. It's the sound of water splashing in the baptistry. It's the sound when you sing praises to the Lord. And today it's a new sound. It's the sound of you letting go of your past, turning it over to God. And I say to you, the louder, the better, because that will bring praise and glory because every rock has a story. So today, I encourage you, Leave it behind and leave with a sense of purpose. Last hour, 
We had people just streaming down here, filing past the front. They just dropped their rock. There were tears. Their hearts were heavy, but their hearts were lighter once they dropped that rock. So whether you drop it when you leave or you drop it in these next few minutes as we sing in one of these sections, you do whatever God lays on your heart as we stand together and as we worship.
nothing worth more that will ever come close nothing can convey your living hope your presence Lord I've tasted and seen all the sweetest of love When my heart becomes free In my shame Thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord In your presence, Lord Hear our prayer Sing, Holy Spirit, you are away.
must become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness, Lord. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the Well, family, it has been a powerful day to spend together. And so I just want to say this before you sign off, uh, that some of you uh, are right where you are. Maybe you're on a park bench. Maybe you're driving. Maybe you're in a family room. Maybe you're in an office place. I just want to say this. Um, that message was for you, and you know it. So I just, I don't want to, I don't want your heart to say, man, I wish I would have been in the room. I've got my own rocks to drop. I want to give up my ability to retaliate. I just, I just want to lay that down, especially in light of what Jesus has done and wants to do in me and through me. And so we just want to say this to you right now, wherever you are right now, I just want to encourage you, go find a rock, go find something heavy and take a moment right now. I know it may seem weird. It seems like you're on your own, but you know, you're not on your own. God knew exactly where you would be. And today is your day. Today is your day to really just release your right to retaliate. Maybe it's got a name, maybe it's got a place, maybe there's a group of people, I don't know what it is, but right now, wherever you are, we're just praying that you right now will recognize this is your moment. Don't miss it. So anything that we can do to help you, as always, and for the rest of you, anybody, if there's a way that we can pastor you, shepherd you, pray for you, help you take your next steps towards Jesus, help you figure out how to get connected in a group, whatever we Whatever we could do for you, we'd love to do that. Just text the word CONNECT to 733-733. Let us help. We just love you. And we want to help you take your next steps towards Jesus. So speaking of that right now, we've got two guys, Derek and Stephen, that love this online family with their whole hearts. And so guys, uh, tell us what's going on in online world, online community. So many incredible things. Catch us up. Derek, Stephen, all you. All right, thanks, Matt. Yeah, what a beautiful picture, everyone, of literally dropping the rock, Derek. That is such a, a good image, and I, I do love Matt's encouragement there to do that. But one of the things we want to highlight is just ways to be involved wherever you are is to be engaged with our ministry. So we're going to go through a couple stories. The very yeah. first one, my favorite, uh, just about 10 days ago, we had the Rampies in town. They're group leaders of ours uh, from Tallahassee, Florida. Yep. Derek, tell us a little bit about that visit. Yeah, so Mark, Marshall, and Joseph came to visit us all the way from Tallahassee, Florida. And like Stephen said, group leaders with us, they've been leading for the past year or so. We love them so much. We, to getting to be with them in person is just such an amazing experience. And like Stephen and another guy on our team got to go see them earlier this year, I guess it was, uh, down in Florida. But then they kind of returned that favor and came up to see us this past week. And we just loved getting to hang out with them, have lunch with them, show them around Southeast. But like I said, it's our favorite thing. To yeah, to do that type yeah of stuff. we do love that. Mark, Marshall, and Joseph are just special people, and just to be able to spend the whole day with them was, was so much fun. And speaking of that, one of the things we want to highlight is this opportunity is always available every Sunday, but we got a special one uh, coming up October 7th, 8th, and 9th. It is homecoming weekend. Yep. Uh, text the word homecoming to 733-733, and you can sign up, Derek. But we're going to do what we just did with the, the Rampies one yeah. weekend all weekend long with a couple hundred of our online yeah. families. So we wanted to highlight what is homecoming, what can 
especially folks that didn't come last year can expect. Friday night, we're going to be hanging out right here. All right. Tell us what we're doing. Yeah, so we're calling it our family fun night. Yeah. So a time to hang out, laugh, but more importantly, have a free taco bar. There we go. Together. We'll, be, we'll be eating tacos here, and I promise you, you're going to make new friends. Yeah. Uh, it's such a beautiful moment. You will laugh. We'll have a great time right here doing that. Then on Saturday morning, you'll join us back here again. Uh, we'll have donuts available. Uh, a few folks will take a tour of Southeast. You get to see That'll it online, but you don't get to see it in person. And yeah. then later on on Saturday, we got going we on. We have our outdoor worship night. So we'll yeah. have a couple of folks from our Southeast uh, worship team that will be leading us in worship. Yep getting to worship together outside with a couple of fire pits yeah. out there. Yeah, it'll be it's fun. It's just a special thing. Yeah. It's just a special thing. Yeah, so big moments. And then obviously Sunday morning we'll worship together, you know, at our Blank and Baker campus. So make sure you sign up. Details online. Text the word homecoming uh, to 733733. Another opportunity to be engaged wherever you are in the world uh, is we have a special online, SE Online family content uh, that we're putting out there called Everything is Backwards. It's all about the Sermon on the Mount. There's several ways you can be engaged. You can find it online on our resources page on our Facebook page, but we want to give you a taste of what to expect with that, so want you to check out this quick clip. Check it out. When you hear the Sermon on the Mount, what is the idea of this? What is it all about? Proclamation of the kingdom to, I guess what I would say is the practicality of it here. Yes. I think the thing that stands out to me most about Sermon on the Mount, that it's very just countercultural, mm -hmm. but it's also counterintuitive. that message about the Sermon on the Mount because it is the central teaching of Jesus. Yeah. So make sure you don't miss it out. But the best way to take this in is with groups. Yep. For sure, that's what this content's dri driven towards. So tell us about groups. Yeah, guys, without a shadow of a doubt, we have this opportunity here in just a couple of weeks, starting the week of October 9th, to be able to land in a group and launch groups again for the second part of the semester. Yeah. The way you can get involved and plugged in, you can get connected today, is by texting groups to 733-733. You'll get a quick automatic text back, click that link, and then you'll see a button that says online groups, and then you'll see all of the options with yep. our group leaders' names listed. Yeah, I promise you, you won't regret it. Just sign up for a group. Yeah, it is. It truly transcends wherever you're located. The location thing becomes an added benefit that you're somewhere else because it's so normal in it. So make sure you sign up for a group. Guys, that's all we have. What a beautiful Sunday of releasing the rock, but also great opportunities to step into community to start living this out. Derek, thank you so much. Yeah. Sign up for homecoming. Sign up for groups. And we'll see you back next week. See you guys.